Welcome to part 4 of this G.I. Joe A Real American Hero series focusing on vehicles and their real world counterparts. Thanks for watching JLS Comics. If you do like the video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe. I upload videos just like this every week. Okay, let's jump into our story. Some of the vehicles on this list serve as actual inspiration for the G.I. Joe version, but many come afterwards and are simply fun to compare and contrast. G.I. Joe Project Manager Kirk Bozigian says he bought a 22-volume set of encyclopedias on the military as part of his research where he looked at armaments, design, and down to uniforms, badges, and tabs, and even acronyms, and said this new toy line needed to feel like it's military. So from early development, all these toys and vehicles and playsets were grounded in reality until the wizards in R&D got their hands on them and they evolved into something else. Later on, much of the realism was lost to the fanciful and sci-fi and the extreme aesthetic of the 1990s. And now with the stage set, let's jump into our first vehicle on today's list. The G.I. Joe's Jump Jetpack was seen from the earliest days of the franchise, from the very first issues of the comic books to the first episodes of the animated series. It was sold as a toy starting in 1982 by itself, and then the next year boxed with a driver named Grand Slam, and it continued through many years and configurations and drivers from Starduster to Duke to Stalker and even Marissa Fairborn as late as 2015. Needless to say, it's been a core component of the G.I. Joe's arsenal since inception. The box for the launch pad and the Jet Mobile Propulsion Unit, or in order, Jet Unit Mobile Propulsion, Jump, said that it is based on the U.S. Army's most advanced and sophisticated designs and that it's part of a new Modern Army G.I. Joe collection. After launching from the Titanium launch pad, the twin rocket propulsion unit on the backpack jet gives the user a full two hours of fuel and is capable of propelling the user to hit up to 150 miles per hour of ground speed. The equipped quote-unquote rapid-fired laser blaster includes an infrared sight that allows accuracy out to 100 yards. Though the technology is said to be part of the advanced future warfare designs of G.I. Joe, the concept of a jetpack begins as early as the 1940s. Though the dream of flying solo dates back to magic carpets and the stories of Daedalus and Icarus who flew too close to the sun, and later to the Rocketeer, Commando Cody, and Buck Rogers. It was a dream of Jules Verne and Leonardo da Vinci and a fantasy of H.G. Wells. The modern idea, though, of a personal aerial vehicle came from a NACA aerodynamicist named Charles Zimmerman. NACA was the National Advisory Committee on Aviation and is the predecessor, the forerunner, to NASA, the National Aeronautical and Space Administration. Zimmerman worked on VTOL, a vertical takeoff and landing technology, for the United States Air Force's Project Mercury before that was taken over by NASA. In 1946, Zimmerman worked at a lab in Langley where he conceived of and built a new design, a portable air transportation device for one person. It was a flying platform that would lift off the ground with a series of ducted fans under the platform and be steered with the weight of its pilot, which was a steering system called kinesthetic control. Zimmerman and his colleague Paul Hill demonstrated their flying platform at Langley and at Wallops Flight Station where it reached 12 feet in the air and hit a top speed of 17 knots and traveled about 31 miles on a 5 gallon fuel tank. The idea was interesting to a lot of people and contracts were awarded to push the idea further along. And this is the DH-4 Helivector which first flew in 1955. It was the Army's one-man flying machine built by DeLochner as the Helivector. The U.S. Army purchased 12 of these and it was redesignated the HZ-1 Aerocycle. The HZ-1 had a 5-gallon fuel tank which gave it also a range of 31 miles and a hover time of 43 minutes thanks to its dual coaxial rotors which were powered by Mercury 55 two-stroke motors made by the same Carl Kikoffer whose Mercury Marine is famous to this day for its outboard marine motors. Those same rotors, however, proved to be a challenge both to the pilot in close proximity to them, but also being close to the ground allowed them to suck up trash and debris and as such resulted in a couple accidents during the flight test period. It was essentially a small platform that rotors, the outboard motor, and sandbags as landing gear. Also flying first in 1955 was the Hiller VZ-1 Pawnee, built by Stanley Hiller's Hiller Helicopters. The flying platform, nicknamed Flying Shoes, used Zimmerman's kinesthetic control designed to steer once in the air. Where Hiller's engineers differed from DeLochner's, however, was that Hiller's team used Zimmerman's original patents, which used propellers inside of the patented Venturi rings. The craft was powered by a 44 horsepower, 4,000 RPM, four-cylinder opposed, two-cycle Nelson H-59 engines, the first two-stroke engine to be certified by the Federal Aviation Administration for use on airframes. As DeLochner's concept fell out of favor, Hiller's Model 1031 became a joint project with the Office of Naval Research and the U.S. Army's Air Mobility Division. And the aircraft evolved into the VZ-1 UH Pawnee, which first flew in 1958. 
1958's Project Grasshopper produced a jump belt for the U.S. Army which would let a soldier leap small distances over ravines, mines, and trenches or allow the wearer to flit out of the line of fire really quickly. It was tested at Fort Benning and the pilot jumped 20 feet high and traversed 300 feet in 9 seconds. In the 1950s, an aeronautical engineer at Bell Aerosystems named Wendell F. Moore designed his own small rocket lifting device which came to be called the Rocket Belt. Winning the contract over the likes of Aerojet, Bell received $25,000 and a new contract from the U.S. Army's Transportation Research Command. It was a hydrogen peroxide rocket propulsion system mounted to a fiberglass corset which, unlike the previous examples, was strapped to the user's body and back. The rocket belt could provide 280 pounds of thrust out of the two rocket nozzles flanking the soldier. In 1960, Harold Graham managed to fly for 13 seconds, a total of 112 feet and a top speed of 10 miles per hour. It was a quick flight, but it led to thousands of test flights during the 1960s. For example, in 1961, Graham took off from a boat and flew to shore, landing a couple hundred feet away from a rather impressed U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Another pilot, Bill Souter, managed to be a stunt double for the James Bond movie Thunderball, where a real rocket belt was used for the film. In 1966, NASA and USGS tested the rocket belt as a potential lunar flying vehicle, meaning there was thought to use it as a device for astronauts. After advancing the design, the rocket belt was now capable of 80 miles per hour for 860 feet in just under 22 seconds. In 1968, NASA awarded Bell with a quarter of a million dollar contract to build lunar vehicles, including the Lunar Escape Astronaut Pogo, LEAP, though those designs were never put in production, but NASA still needed something for its spacewalkers. Around the same time, as all the other developments were advancing, an aerospace engineer named Peter Van Schaik at Wright-Patterson Air Base developed another jetpack. Dubbed the Astronaut Maneuver Unit, AMU, the propulsion backpack and handheld nitrogen-powered handheld device enabled Gemini 4 astronaut Ed White to successfully complete America's first EVA, Extravehicular Activity, a spacewalk. Then, once the reusable space shuttle came into use in 1984, astronauts came to use the AMU, the Astronaut Maneuver Unit, and later the MMU. Peter later revealed that inspiration for his device came from a comic book called Buck Rogers. Richard Browning and the Gravity Industries Gravity Team have recently developed a 1050 BHP gravity jet suit which puts out 317 pounds of thrust as it burns through 5 and a quarter gallons of jet fuel. That's more than a Bugatti Veyron, nearly one and a half Indy cars. It's phenomenal, Richard Browning said about that amount of propulsion. All that power in mini jet engines affixed to the user's forearms and one, the largest, at the center of the user's back. The pack itself is a 3D printed aluminum shoulder harness wired up with electronics and guidance for the five engines. And the Mark III version, it said, can hit a top speed of 85.6 miles per hour of ground speed. Browning and the Gravity Team have tested the Gravity Jet Suit with Britain's Royal Marines for shipboarding operations, as well as with the Great North Air Ambulance Service for rescue operations. In fact, Browning flew to a simulated casualty site in just 90 seconds, meaning that could save a lot of lives. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, is still interested in the feasibility of all this technology, along with wingsuits, power gliders, and the similar personal air mobility systems, so it'll be interesting to see where all this R&D leads us into the future. And recently, former Swiss Air Force pilot Yves Rossi created a wingsuit system with a semi-rigid hull and carbon fiber wings that's powered by four Jetcat P-400 jet engines. It's a crazy piece of tech that has earned Yves the nickname of Jetman. If this looks familiar, it should, as it resembles Cobra's Claw, the covert light aerial weapon. The Cobra Claw was first released in 1984 and saw use in comic books, animation, and toy collections. It came equipped with extendable wingtips, unguided 10-pound HE-8 Venom missiles, a 2000 RPM, 7.6mm machine gun, DES-28 Bravo 750-pound flashfire bomb, and is powered by two DES Mini-55 turbojet engines. It also featured vertical stabilizers, leg shields, gas pressurized shock absorbers, and some neat stickers. In 1987, Cobra also got another flying machine, a Cobra Jetpack. This was hardened flying platform powered by double pack 5 million pound thrust turbofan engines and came armed with quad blast 25mm axial firing machine guns, an AIM-44 air-to-air missile, and control surfaces and computers for steering, thrust, and stabilization. These were used heavily by Cobra for air superiority just above the battlefield and in direct opposition to the Joes and their jump packs. Claws were also deployed for E&E, &E, for insertion, and into an air-to-ground roll where the pilot could strafe the ground with the four machine guns. Cobra also had a flight pod, nicknamed Trouble Bubble, which was first released in 1985, though it did debut in 1984's G.I. Joe animated miniseries where Cobra attempted to hijack a shuttle from a space shuttle launch complex right at the beginning. 
The trouble bubble could hit 80 miles per hour, had a max range of 120 miles, and was piloted from a command chair with armrest controls from behind a clear, shell-proof, domed canopy. Trouble Bubble was used heavily by Cobra in a variety of roles on the battlefield, frequently overlapping mission types with that of the Claw. It came armed with a 30 cal XM-97 machine gun, two Warlock long-range missiles, and an SNK-7 aerial mine. The closest design to this is the Bell H-13 Sue, made famous by the Alanalda helmed TV show MASH, and honestly, it's mostly due to the bubbled dome canopy over the cockpit. The Bell 47, Sue's prototype, first flew in December of 1945. Originally designed as a basic training helicopter, over 5,600 models were built and that original purpose was expanded to a variety of other roles such as medevac during the Korean War like we saw in MASH and even a low observation role as late as the Vietnam War. It could seat up to three people inside the bubble canopy and this craft could travel 273 miles at 84 miles per hour and had a top speed of 105 miles per hour. The armed OH-1 variant came with twin M37C 30 cal MGs or dual M60s. In 1966, the Sioux was replaced by the OH-6, which brings us to our next vehicle. In 1990, the G.I. Joe team received a light scout and ground support helicopter with limited stealth that was called the Locust. The Locust had a 420 horsepower General Monopolies turboshaft engine with an infrared suppressed exhaust capable of 180 miles per hour when fully laden for two hours of flight time. The Locust was armed with skewer, compact heat seeking, air to air missiles, dual 20mm pneumatic drive chain guns, and a chafe flare dispenser that were all controlled from an armored seat behind a smoked plexiglass blast resistant canopy with advanced FLIR and other onboard optics and tracking systems. And this brings us back to 1966 when the OH-6 Cayuse light observation helicopter replaced the OH-1 Sioux. As a similar design to the G.I. Joe's Locust, the Cayuse has earned the nickname Flying Egg. A crew of two controls the 370 shaft horsepower Allison T-63 engine to a top speed of 147 miles per hour and comes with a range of 413 miles and a surface ceiling of 15,800 feet up in the air. Later it was configured to be outfitted with and equipped with a variety of armaments from Hydra 70mm unguided rockets to Mark 19 grenade launchers to 7.63mm miniguns to tow or Hellfire anti-tank missiles or 12.7mm machine gun pods. When armed, the flying egg became a killer egg. This loach had been used for transport, escort, recon, light attack, fire support, ground support, insertion, and during the Vietnam War, the OH-6 paired up with the AH-1 Cobra to draw out enemies so that the Cobra gunships could take out the enemies. Over 1,400 loaches flew in Vietnam, but because of that specific mission, many were destroyed as they were drawing out the North Vietnamese small arms fire from below. Over the years, the Cayos has been heavily modified and is now used by the DEA, CIA, Special Operations, and starting in 1980 by the Night Stalkers, the Army's Special Operations 160th Air Regiment, SOAR, where this variant was redesignated the MH6 Little Bird. The G.I. Joe team also uses an assault copter, most frequently flown by Wild Bill, codenamed Dragonfly. This was repainted as the Tigerfly and actually renamed in the year 2000 when Hasbro temporarily lost the trademark to the Dragonfly name and so that particular model was also called Locust. The pilot and gunner are seated in tandem and from there control the twin turboshaft General Electric T700 engines which can push the helo to 220 miles per hour or as far as 510 miles. The XH1 Dragonfly was first boxed in 1983 along with its pilot Wild Bill. It was armed with a 25mm Vulcan Gatling gun, a laser-guided 160mm cannon pod, Sidewinder air-to-ground missiles, Sidewinder HE missiles, M34 grenade launcher, X551 mini cannon, and pylons for additional weapons and apparatus like Scorpion, anti-tank rockets, fire and forget, air-to-air dragon fire, anti-aircraft missiles, or a Hughes 230 chain gun, and 1200 rounds of ammunition. The Dragonfly was used for nearly any mission the G.I. Joe team is called out for, from rescue and evac to ground support, transport, air superiority, you name it. There was even a time when Snake Eyes and Wild Bill strapped the body of a mercenary named Quinn to the skids to fly him out to a point in Long Island for a burial ceremony. The real world version of the XH-1 Dragonfly is the Bell AH-1 Cobra. In the mid-1960s, Mike Foles at Bell Helicopter was told to work on hovercrafts and VTOL technology that we talked about before after they had lost an attack helicopter contract to Lockheed. However, in 1962, Bell showed off the design D-255 Iroquois Warrior to some impressed U.S. Army officials. This was a sleek, narrow, futuristic silhouette that retained the power plant and some of the design of the larger UH-1 Hueys. Two years later, the U.S. military had their very own purpose-built attack helicopter. 
This was happening as the Vietnam War was at its peak. In the war, Bell's UH-1 Hueys, equipped with door gunners and some rocket pods, were slow and susceptible to ground fire, and these were primarily used for transport and medevac due to this. So the AH-1 entered service, protecting the Hueys and also pairing up with loaches, as I mentioned earlier, as hunter-killer teams, where the loach would draw out the gunfire, the Cobra would lock in on it, and unleash hell. The Cobra was armed with a 2.75 inch 70mm FFARs as folding fin aerial rockets and either M158 7 tube or M219 tube rocket launchers, along with a lethal chin mounted M28 M28A1 chain gun. The improved designs included the AH 1 Super Cobra, AH 1 J Sea Cobra, and the Marines AH 1 W Super Cobra. However, the US Marines now fly the AH 1 Z Viper, the Zulu Cobra, being the latest in the development life of the Cobra and now boasts a four-blade composite rotor system instead of the previous two-blade system. And these are flown by the Marines' light attack helicopter squadrons on missions ranging from close air support, armed escort, aerial recon, fire support coordination, and air-to-ground superiority, just like the G.I. Joe's Dragonfly. And with that, we've arrived at the end of this installment of G.I. Joe vehicles and their real-world counterparts. What's your favorite vehicle on this list? Let me know in the comments below, and stay tuned in coming weeks as we continue to explore the vehicles of G.I. Joe and Cobra. Until then, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.